for this opportunity to come out and give this guest lecture. I'm really excited to present to everyone about the topic of good to great. So I'm just going to give a quick, very quick introduction to myself personally. My name is Sean. Uh, in terms of my personal why, like why I say I work, why I'm here, is I love making the internet more valuable. It's the area that I've concentrated most of my career in, is the internet. And I aspire to create greatness where I go. So what I currently do is I'm the Chief Operations Officer at a digital marketing agency known as Vine Digital. Um, we're a fast growing, just past the startup stage, we're four and a half years old as a company. And it's my job to manage our service delivery, which basically means to make sure that we maintain quality as we continue to grow really fast because our company's been in the Australian Financial Review's uh, fast starters, top 100 fast starters in Australia for the last three years in a row. So my job is to like maintain the quality while we keep rapidly growing. Cool. So today's lecture is about the book Good to Great, and I just want to get a quick understanding of how many of you, firstly, how many of you have read this book before? Okay, great. You're going to get huge value from this lecture because you haven't heard it before. How many of you have heard of this book before? Cool. One. Great. Yeah, that's the lecture. Fantastic. <laughs> You're going to get huge value from this lecture. <laughs> um, Good to Great is a very famous business book. I was just reading about how it would rank amongst business books and it was rated number third uh, most influential of all time. So it's a very, very famous book um, depending on who you ask they'll say relatively different amounts of famousness. But to give you some ideas, it was published in 2001. So it's almost 20 years old. And 4 million plus copies have been sold. And this is just a quote that was cited by several members of the Wall Street Journal CEO Council as the best management book they've read. So it's a fantastic book. I personally read it for the first time about 10 years ago. And then I read it a few times again, because some books are so good that you can reread them years later and get, get new concepts from them. So in preparation for this lecture, I decided to reread it again while I was putting together the lecture. So here's an introduction to the concept of the book, the core compelling idea of this book. What, hap what would happen if you woke up one day and you realized that you lead a very average, typical life? Right? You have a typical average job in a very average company that doesn't really perform that well, but it's okay, it's all right. If you want to use really harsh language, you, this is the language they use in the book, you have the curse of mediocrity, which means you, you can't seem to escape the trap of just being average. Right? You don't really know what it is that's causing you to not progress. And it, by the way, I, I want to be clear up front, it's not about judging averageness per se. Being average is okay. It's just not for everyone. Some people have this yearning to be different, to strive for something greater, to be a high achiever. So if you hunger to achieve greatness, then this book is for you because it's about the principles of greatness. So what happens if you wake up one day and you realize that, what do you do? Well, I would suggest, and that's what this book does, study the principles of greatness scientifically. So try to analyze what it is that makes a great person or a great company tick. How do they work? What do they do? And much of the things that we do when we come to uni or we read books or we watch YouTube videos that inspire us, we're really just trying to do that. We're just studying how greatness works. We're studying how excellence works and we're striving to do it. But what I'm going to talk about first and foremost before we walk into the findings of the book is the methodology of the book, which is how do you study greatness? What kind of approach can you take that's really scientific? So I'm going to draw an analogy. Actually, would you mind if I use the whiteboard marker? Cool. I'm going to draw an analogy to illustrate how this um, study was done for this, com uh, for this book. By the way, it took, I'll get that in a minute, but it took the team a couple of years to write this book, and it was a research team of up to 21 people. Now imagine you want to study, I'm going to use the analogy of uh, medalists in the Olympic Games. So imagine you want to study what it is that makes a gold medalist, but for the sake of this analogy working, imagine that a gold medalist is three to six times better than a silver medalist, right? So up here you have gold, and it's a certain performance standard, and then over here you have your silver, and then underneath you have the rest. 
And again, imagine the gap between silver and gold is three to six times better in terms of performance, right? So how would we go about scientifically studying what makes a gold medalist? Well, we could ask a really good question. A really good question would be, what does it take to make an Olympic gold medalist? That's a very good question. And you could go and you could interview a gold medalist and you could say, what did you do to become a gold medalist? And they'd probably give you a bunch of really good answers. They'd say like, I trained really hard. I was really disciplined. I had a good diet, etc., etc." And those are good answers, but they're actually not the answers we're looking for. And I'll get to the better questions in a second. Many of the business books that I've read are like this question. It's like interviewing the gold medalist and asking, why are you a gold medalist? What did you do? Again, not a bad question, and there are many good books about this, but there are better questions. How about a better question? What does an Olympic gold medalist do differently from the silver medalist? That's a better question than the first one, because what we're trying to do is not just isolate this by itself, but we're trying to see what differentiates the silver uh, medalist from the gold medalist. And that, so that's a better question, but the best question, which is even better than that, is what do all Olympic gold medalists do differently from all silver medalists? So it's, it's trying to find consistent principles of differentiation between the gold medalists and the silver medalists that are consistent findings across entire sets. And so what you would do if you really wanted to do good science is you try to find gold and silver medals who came from very similar environments. And then you isolate them into pairs. And then you contrast how they perform, how they act. So I'm going to give you an example. If you went to a gold medalist and you said, what do you do to be a gold medalist? They're going to tell you, I, I worked really hard, right? I tried really hard. I, I, I practiced really hard, right? But it's very likely that a silver medalist also works really hard. It's very likely a silver medalist is also quite disciplined in their training. After all, they managed to make it to the Olympic Games. So that point in and of itself isn't particularly interesting. It's not necessarily what differentiates the gold medalist from the silver medalist. It's just one of the general good things they do. So from this perspective, working hard is what gets you in the game. But getting you from bronze to gold to silver is something else. It might be something else. And that's what this study is about. So here's a high-level diagram about what this book is about. And in some sense, my giving this lecture, I'm going to be sort of like, you know how a musician would do a cover for a piece of music that they really like, right? They'd sing the same song as some other famous artist. In some sense, I'm going to do that. I'm going to present all of the findings of this study as, in a sense, a cover. So here's the core concept of the Good to Great study. The question is, could a mediocre company, some very typical average company, successfully make a transition to become a really outstanding company? And they, they really want to study this with a lot of rigor. So here are the rules that they built around this study. The first thing is, they isolated companies and comparisons that from a transition point before, so year zero minus for 15 years, their performance was very comparable. So it's almost like studying two silver medalists, and then one of them went on to become a gold medalist, while the other didn't. That's the essence of the good to great study. So for 15 years before, they had to be tracking along with average performance, and then there had to be a defined transition point, and then the good to great companies managed to outstrip the performance of their comparators by three to six times across a period of 15 years. So they had to define this really precisely. The reason they said 15 years is because that's long enough to outlive the tenure of most leadership teams, most executive teams. So you, it's usually not just going to be a single CEO that managed to come in and turn it all around. It had to be a, a sustained transition for the entire organization. That's what makes it really interesting. So how did they do that? Well, the research team had 21 people. Some people came and left during the time. And the study itself lasted five years. The good to great companies achieved on average 6.9 times general market returns. The minimum was three times. And they sifted through 1,435 companies to find 11 good to great examples where the, the comparison companies, the silver medalists, failed to make a transition. They also made especially um, sure that they took a lot of care 
to not find companies that just happen to be what they said on a rocket when it takes off. So some companies just happen to be in the right industry at the right moment, and the whole industry has the wind behind its back, and they all perform well. They worked really hard to sift out those kinds of cases because that's not really what they were looking for. They were looking for the principles of greatness that could be found in this transition. So as I said, 15 years, 15 years before and after, before they were together, after they went up, and they had to have an unsuccessful comparison. If they couldn't find a comparison company, they didn't make the cut. Because you need, it's like, that would be just like studying the gold medals. You need the gold and the silver. Then, what the research team did is simply ask why. And that, that question took five years to answer, which is what were the differentiating factors between the good and the great? What did all 11 of the great transition companies do that all 11 of their comparisons did not do? That could really help us to answer that question. So I'm going to give you a little high-level um, preview of the findings. So what happened is they, they did this research and they created a framework of concepts based on this research. And I'm going to talk a bit about those concepts. Firstly, they're quite counterintuitive. So some of the things that they found go against the popular business culture, against your assumptions. Um, they're also quite nuanced and subtle, but also, as in the words within the book, deceptively simple and straightforward. So it's very interesting how these findings, they, they go against your intuitions, but they also make a lot of sense as soon as you hear them. And hopefully that will be the journey that I take you on in this lecture, is to go through the findings one by one, and you'll see how they make sense. So in this lecture, I'm going to summarize the findings at a high level. And we'll go through the entire book, actually. Cool, so this is the framework that they synthesized from the study. What they discovered is certain things happened during a build-up phase, which is before the successful transition, and then there was that transition point, and then there was a breakthrough. And all of these concepts are a single chapter within the book that speaks about that concept in isolation, and they all tie together. It's actually a very elegant framework because all of the findings have relationships with each other that are very interesting. So all of the 11 good to great companies had all of these things going for them. They all did exactly those things. And the comparison companies did not. So we'll go through each case. Wait, before we proceed, any questions? Does that all make sense so far? Good? Cool. All right, are you all interested? What we're going to find? Cool. All right. Let's start with the first chapter, which is called Level 5 Leadership. So, now I want all of you to think about what it might take to turn a company from good to great. I want you to imagine, what if you were the CEO in a company that, you know, you just took over an average company that's been average for a long time, and you've been expected to make a transition from good to great. Uh, what do you think you would do, or how do you think it would work? So the first thing you'd think is, well, maybe you find the right external CEO to come into this mediocre, sleepy company. You hire that CEO, and they come in with a massive amount of vision, and they see what's wrong, and they shake up the company, and they make it work, right? That, that would be our common business intuition. So in this particular study, the sh oh, yes, yes, good. sorry, uh, you're correct, sorry, I forgot to explain, very basic. They use the share price of the company as a measure of its performance. Sorry, I totally forgot, I showed you all these graphs, but I never explained that it was the share price. So these are the share prices of the companies. So they wanted to use a, a public measure that's very easy and straightforward to measure. So they used share price. So in the cases of um, the, the good to great companies, if you had invested in them at the transition point, which is that one, then held that stock for 15 years, you would have had a three to six, at least three to six times better return on investment than the others. Great question, thank you. Yeah, I forgot to explain that basic piece of information. Yeah, so, um, cool. So, by the way, this makes sense, right? If you're in a, an average company, you totally expect that you, an external CEO comes and turns it around, but that's not actually how it works. Here's a quote from the first chapter that I really love. Larger than life, celebrity leaders who ride in from the outside are negatively correlated with going from good to great. 10 of the 11 good to great CEOs came from within the company, whereas comparison companies tried external CEOs six times more often. 
So that's the first counterintuitive finding because we, we are in this culture where when your company is broken, when it's average, when it's not taking off, we have this culture of hiring people in to fix it. That's the, the idea that we have. But that's negatively correlated with the transition from good to great. Why is that? This is my personal speculation on top of the concepts of the book. I think that internal people uh, or have more intuitions about why the organization is average and they've usually been in the company for longer. They're more culturally attuned and yeah, more familiar and more committed to that organization. But let's go on to the actual concepts of this, this study. So what happened when they started the study is that the author, Jim Collins, told the research team, don't focus on the leadership. Don't focus on the executives. Why is that? He called himself, in his own words, a recovering leadership atheist. So what it means is, in our popular business culture, we tend to ascribe all of the blame or all of the credit to the executive team, to the CEO or the management team. And so when they went into the study, he specifically told his team, don't focus all of your efforts on the leadership. Focus on the entire organization. What did the whole organization do? as opposed to just one or two leaders. They were really trying to debunk this idea. But what happened is the research team, after a period of time studying these companies, kind of turned against the leader, the author. And they said, no, you're, you're wrong. There's something unique about the leaders that created these good to great transitions. They all seem to be cut from the same cloth. They have something in similar with, in, uh, similar with each other. And so after a long time of debating what that is, they created this framework to explain the differences between the leadership that they observed in the good to great transitions and the comparison companies. So in short, what they found is that in the good to great companies, they found what they came to call level five executives, which I'll explain in a moment. And in all of the transition companies, they found what they called level four executives. So what does that mean? Well, you'll see there's a bit of a framework here that describes a kind of progression of individuals. And this is really relevant for all of us who are in a business context. So at level one, you have someone who's a highly capable individual, can make productive contributions through your talent, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Level two, you have a contributing team member. So it's level one plus something, which is that you can work in a team and contribute as a team. Level three, you have a competent manager, someone who organizes people and resources towards the effective and efficient pursuit of predetermined outcomes. Then you get to level four, which is what the comparison companies had. They called them an effective leader. They catalyzed commitment to and vigorous pursuit of clear and a compelling vision, stimulating high performance standards. So what they found is these, these comparison companies had good leaders. This is really an important point to make about the study. They frequently reiterated that the comparison companies were not dog companies. They, they didn't, the job of this wasn't to talk down those comparison companies. Just like if you're studying a silver and a gold medalist, the job isn't to talk about how bad the silver medalist is. So the, the comparison companies had good leadership, but they didn't have what they came to call level five leadership, which is one level above. And what they, they found is that these leaders had a very particular personality. That personality was a paradoxical blend of personal humility and professional will. So I'll go into what that means in a second, but it's a very interesting finding. So on top of being an effective leader, all of the things that you'd expect an effective leader to be, the people who managed to create a group to great transition had a personality that had this paradox. They were very personally humble people, but they had a lot of willpower. So here's an example that, that compares some of the very specific findings to do with the personalities of level four versus level five. I put this in table from the book. Level five leaders, how do they manifest their humility? Or well, when, when the time comes to talk about credit, when something's going well, what does a level five leader do? They give the credit to other people. They always, and they actually, in the study, they interviewed many of the executives who were in charge of these good great companies. And what they found is when they asked them, like, what did you do? You guys did something amazing. The results are really good. The executives frequently say, well, I was surrounded by really great people, or we were really lucky. They didn't say, oh yeah, I'm a really smart person. They were very humble. They, they came across as even modest, but that, that's deceptive because they were also very full of willpower. So as opposed to the level four leaders, what they frequently found is these level four leaders in the comparison companies were more egotistical. 
they were more interested in taking the credit to themselves. Many of them had a greater interest in their own profiles. Some of them would pay less attention to the company, more attention to their own personal profile, like how can I make myself famous and great. Um, and, and the other side of this, they came to call this the window and the mirror. The window means looking out and seeing other factors. The mirror means looking and seeing yourself. So for the level five leaders, when it came to credit, they saw the window. They saw other people that gave credit to other people. When it came to blame, whose fault is it that something's going wrong? They saw the mirror. They said, it's my fault. So they took the blame onto themselves. Whereas the level four leaders would blame others or circumstances. Now this makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? If you want to be uh, an effective executive, you need to have this approach that when things are going wrong, you take responsibility and you try to fix it. Uh, and yes, it, it, this is what I mean by counterintuitive. Yeah. Like the findings of the study are counterintuitive. You would think that an egotistical, um, flying in from outside on a horse to save the company kind of leader would be able to create a turnaround but it's negatively correlated with success. Like based on the study, that doesn't work as well. And yeah, so this first finding, again, very counterintuitive. Um, going to the point of professional well, uh, will, the level five leaders were ambitious first and foremost for the company. Their ambition and their will was, I want to make this a great company. Whereas the level four leaders were more so ambitious for themselves. They want to make a mark on the company. They wanted to put their stamp on something so that it could look back and shine the credit towards them. In the book, they specifically, they actually interviewed one of the level five leaders and they asked him, what's the difference between you and the CEO of the name, the comparison company? And after thinking about it for a moment, he said, I am more of a plow horse. He is more of a show horse. Mm -hmm. So it's about which, which one is there to get work done which is, versus which one is there to make a big show. And that's how they compared them. Uh, another important finding is that the level five leaders set up their companies for future success after they left, whereas the level four leaders didn't think much about succession. So they were focused more on having an impact and, you know, going to the point about level four, if you have a great impact and you make the company start to transition and then you leave and it goes down, how much more does that say that you were an amazing leader? Because without you, it faltered. Whereas the level five leaders didn't think that way. They thought, how can we sustain a transition over the long time? And as I said before, often the internal candidates were promoted and were those kinds of leaders, whereas level four leaders often came from outside. So here's one of the principles from this, uh, this chapter. And uh, I'll speak about this, how we apply this in my workplace, because I think it's a very compelling principle. So you know how I spoke about blame, where the level five leaders would take the credit and give it to other people and take the responsibility to themselves. They coined this term in the book called autopsies without blame. You all know what an autopsy is, right? It's like when someone dies, you cut them open and you try to determine what the cause of death was, right? So in the level five environments, they had this idea of conducting autopsies without blame. How does that work? Well, what happens is the leader, whoever that is, says to everyone, you know, if some, something went really badly, if they made a, a bad acquisition and it failed or something like that, the leader would say, I shoulder all responsibility for this failure. Now let's try to figure out what happened. So the blame is immediately allocated fully, like 100% to the manager, to the leader, and they accept that blame on themselves. And then what that does is it, it makes other people more comfortable to speak up about what happened because they don't feel like they will be blamed for the failure. So this is an important principle about trying to find the truth in an organization, which is that blaming dampens the truth. When you're in a company culture where people are blaming each other a lot, it dampens the flow of truth because you can't really figure out what's happening. It's too much of finger pointing to each other, right? So uh, here's, here's how you can apply this principle in your life. Um, it's, it's really difficult actually to apply this idea because they, they were more so speaking about the personality of the leaders. They weren't so speaking about what they did. But if you have this, this professional will, focus your willpower on the organization that you're in as opposed to your own progression necessarily. And the humility, so what I think professional will brings you is it gives you strength and focus. And what humility gives you is it helps you to see clearly because you are willing to be wrong. 
So being this kind of leader is really hard, but the following concepts or the concepts in the rest of the book explain what these leaders did and what their habits. Let's go to the next finding. This is one of my favorite findings of the book. So let's start off with what our intuitions would be about how to turn a company from good to great. To turn a company from good to great, you'd think someone would come along who has a massive amount of vision about what's wrong in the company, and that person knows exactly what to do. They're a genius. They're really smart. They know what to do. Then that person becomes the CEO, and they manage to successfully broadcast that vision to all levels of the organization, and they manage to get alignment and buy-in from the other people in the organization. And everyone gets it. They're really good at generating alignment, and they execute the vision, and then they succeed. That makes a lot of sense. That's what our intuitions would be. But that's actually not how it worked. And this is, again, another interesting counterintuitive finding. So this is what happens when that happens. What I just described is a single visionary comes in with a lot of good ideas and disciplines an organization into shape. Well, this is a company called Teledyne. And uh, what happened is a, a guy by the name of I forget, Henry Singleton joined the company and he was really good he was very very good he knew what he was doing he had a lot of vision he could discipline a sleepy mediocre organization and the stock price reflected it so the results were really good but what happened is after he left the organization descended back to its mediocrity so this is what they called an unsustained uh transition uh they had in the study they had the the 11 pairs of good to great and they had something like six or seven unsustained transitions that they also studied, which is what, what happens when it goes up a little bit, but then it drops back down. Now, it's important to draw attention to the time frame. This is one thing I love about this book. Everything we're talking about is really long term. That's what's really good about this book. It speaks about long term trends and principles. So you can see that this guy, Henry Singleton, was around for a good number of years. But then when he left, it fell apart. What happened is they the author, Jim Collins, coined a term called a genius with a thousand helpers. So what happens when you have a, a really visionary person who has a strong personality come into an organization, what do they do? Well, they tend to recruit people who will do what they want them to do, aka a competent assistant or helper. So they'll hire people who can execute on their vision, but they won't hire people who are particularly visionary of themselves. They'll hire people good at execution. And so as long as that single visionary is around and the vision from that visionary is around, great, the, the organization can perform well under that leadership. But when they leave, what you have is a company of a thousand helpers left over. In other words, you have people who lack direction or who lack vision because it wasn't inherited from that single leader because they were hired not for their vision, but they were hired for their ability to just execute on someone else's ideas. And so that's what happened in this particular case of Taladine, is they caused an un, uh, unsustained transition. So what actually happens in the good to great organizations is that the genius with a thousand helpers model doesn't work, and the good to great leaders thought differently. What they thought first is, and this is the concept of this chapter, first who, then what. So. What they didn't, they didn't first figure out, now we're going to use an analogy that they use in the book, the bus. Let's say the company is the bus. They didn't first figure out where to take the bus. First they figured out who is going to be on the bus and who's going to be off the bus and who's going to be in which seats. In other words, they spent a lot of time on figuring out the lineup, the team. Almost like a coach that's coming into a team. They don't spend a lot of time initially just talking about how are we going to do this play or this play. They first figure out which players are going to be on the team. Then they figure out how to do the plays. So that's how the good to great uh, companies worked and their, their leaders worked. They focused a lot of their initial time on who should be here and who should be off the bus and which seats should they be in. And some cases were really extreme. In one case, a, a CEO was leading, uh, I think it was a, one of the companies was a family owned company. And he even fired his brother from the team because he was one of the wrong people on the team. There are very few people willing to do that. But that's that will side of the level five leadership. Like, I will fire my brother if that's the right thing to do. So here's an example from the study, a very interesting, compelling example. Um, one of the companies is Fannie Mae. Before we go into this, 
Uh, some of you, if you're really into your stats, you'll know that Fannie Mae didn't necessarily perform very well over the long term. It's important to acknowledge that the, the scope of the study is 15 years before and 15 years after. Some of the companies that made this transition didn't sustain it over the extreme long term. But that doesn't mean that they didn't once manage to achieve it over quite an extended period of time. Fannie Mae is one of them. It's been criticized. The book has been criticized because of the inclusion of this um, company. So Fannie Mae is a, a mortgage um, company, and they were losing $1 million every day with $56 billion underwater in the moment. So I want you guys to imagine, I don't think I have the stomach at all. Imagine you became the CEO of a company that's losing a $1 million every day. Uh, what, what do you do? Imagine further how much pressure there would be on you to act. Imagine that the shareholders, the board of directors, everyone is putting huge amounts of pressure on you as a CEO. Do something. We're losing so much money. Get something done. But what did he do? His first act as a CEO was to interview all of the top executives and to tell them how ridiculously hard it was going to be to turn around the situation. He was very brutal. He was very honest with them. In that process, 16, uh, 14 of the 26 top executives either left the company or were replaced by him. So that's the team lineup thing. He first figured out who are we going to get onto which seats in the bus before he figured out what to do. Another example is um, Coleman Mockler. Gillette was one of the gold medalists, one of the good to great companies. 55% of his time in the first two years, he spent on HR decisions and it was focused on the executive management team. 38 out of 50 people moved to a different role or moved out of the company. That's a significant amount of change in the executive team. And that's a very, very crucial point because if you have a company that's faltering, that's performing in a very mediocre way, if you don't first figure out who to change, it can be very difficult to generate the kind of visionary strategy and alignment. Who is very, very important. So, and this is the summary of the findings. Before vision, before strategy, before tactics, before organizational structure, before technology, the first choice was who. Mm. Like, how does great CEO determine which person is suitable in that particular role of good line or good line is a uh, best role? Probably he's better in off doing something else uh, mm. in a different department. Like, yeah. what are the necessary skills? Good question. I think, firstly, one of the key things they focused on was the, the personality traits of that person and then their performance. And in, in one case, they actually interviewed one of the good to great leaders, and he said, I would first give people a chance to try in another role, just in case they, they, might be on, they might be the right person, but they're on the wrong seat in the bus. But I'd say the two quick answers are personality and traits. They had to be, the, they were level five leaders, and they brought in other people like them. And then performance, just the raw performance of that individual. Hmm. Really good question. There's actually some commentary here in a second about what he means by the right people. He uses this term in the book a lot, the right people. And I think it's a very good term. So here's the comparison companies, the silver medalist versus the gold medalist. And we'll get to answering some of that point in a minute. So the level five management team, the leader first thinks, who am I going to get on this team and who am I going to get off? And then together, we'll figure out what to do, where to take the bus. Whereas the level four manager says, first what? Which is, I'm going to figure out what to do in this company, where to take it, and then who? Who should I hire to make this happen? And it's a completely different paradigm. It's a very opposite way of thinking. But it worked. And again, the data very, very firmly supports this finding. So here's, here's my speculation as to why this is the case. Like, why does this principle work this way? I think the key point is that the level four leader is one genius, one smart person. And people can be really smart, and they can be really visionary. I'm not discounting that. But in the case of the level five management team, you have a team of people who vigorously debate. And they mention this a lot in the book. They really debated what they should do. And they really honed in on the insights of how to manage their company. So it's harder to get alignment when you have a bunch of people, especially who have very differing opinions, a bunch of brilliant people. But once you get alignment, it's really, really good alignment. And so that's a, a very firm finding from the study. Um, yeah, cool. Here are some quotes about the right people. These are some of the ideas that I use also in my work, and I really try to apply this. If you have the right people on the bus, 
the problem of how to motivate and manage people largely goes away. The right people don't need to be tightly managed or fired up. They will be self-motivated by the inner drive to produce the best results and be part of something great. So that's the first principle that I personally find very relevant in my management, which is I don't manage people per se. I don't fire people up or motivate them per se. Instead, I hire people who are intrinsically fired up, who are motivated by themselves, who want to be part of something really awesome. Those are the people I hire. And the, the counterintuitive, which I'll get into the next slide, is the wrong people need to be motivated, but the right people need to not be demotivated. Does that make sense? The right people are intrinsically motivated to produce the best results they can. You just have to manage things such that you don't screw it up so that they get annoyed with you and leave. Whereas the wrong people need to be fired up and motivated with lots of speeches, and etc. So that's the first quote. The second quote, strong performance, performers are intrinsically motivated by performance. And when they see their efforts impeded by carrying extra weight, they eventually become frustrated. One of the dominant themes that runs throughout this book is that if you have successfully implemented the findings, you don't need to spend time and energy motivating people. If you have the right people on the bus, they'll be self-motivated. The question then becomes, how do you manage it in such a way to not demotivate them? So one of the things that, that when they started the interviews with the good to great executives, one of the interview questions was, how did you create alignment? How did you, because you were going to make a transition from good to great, you need to make a lot of change in the company. How did you get everybody on board? And what was interesting is the executives didn't really find that an interesting question at all. They said, and we'll get to the other findings, but they said we didn't need to generate much alignment. It generated itself once we debated and found the correct course of action. And that's what happens when you have a team of, quote unquote, the right people. So, here are some ways that you can apply this principle into your life. So I've, I've split it out to between personal and professional. Because I've, I've spent some time while writing this lecture to think about how could you apply this idea into your life. The first is, in a personal level, you've probably heard the quote that you are the average of the five people closest to you, right? So if you want to strive to be a high-performing individual to get really far, then you should have a personal board of directors, which is you should surround yourself with some of the smartest, best people who are high performers, because then you will, by stint of just being around them, strive to perform yourself. So figure out who you want to be in your professional life. One of the coolest things that I love about this finding is it's willing to talk about people. So much of our um, culture, our business culture, we shy away from talking about people or criticizing people or praising people. We focus more on things like technology or systems or processes, but we don't focus enough talking about people. So it, the personal finding is you can find out who do you want to be around, who, what, who is your who, who do you want to be around. And then my professional finding, which, which I strive to apply, is think very clearly about people. That's very, very important in your management. I'd say, going back to the, the previous slide here, um, as I said from these two examples, under immense pressure, these CEOs focused their first efforts on the people who were on the bus, instead of what to do, instead of some kind of particular vision. So if you're a manager, in a company, think very clearly about the people and ask yourself, are these people the right people on the bus? And are they in the right seat? And spend a lot of your time, energy, and attention on these questions in your work. And that will help you to perform better. And then once you have clarity on it, don't hesitate to make changes. There's nothing worse than having the wrong person on the bus for a long period of time. If you want to um, find out more about what he defines as the right people, I suggest reading the book, because it goes into a bit more detail about what it means as the right people. But in my opinion, having been a manager, I've been a manager for a couple of years, I think it's usually very clear to you whether someone's the right person. Like, it's kind of obvious, like, this person's doing a great job, the results are good, the, the clients really love them, they're proactive, they have a lot of knowledge. There's just a lot of things that are positive signs. Whereas when someone's the wrong person, just problems tend to follow them a lot. So it usually is quite clear about people. Um, that's, and it's an overly simplistic language to say it's the wrong person or the right person. It's a little bit too dichotomous. Some people have different levels of standard, but in general, it's a good way of thinking.
So I'd suggest if you're a manager, be like an architect. Spend most of your time designing the people system and the workflows and responsibilities. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Because before what people do, you can think about who's responsible for what things. That's, that's an architect of a, an HR land, of, like a coach of a team. Cool. Any questions? Any more questions about that? So obviously there's a huge focus on getting the right people. So I'm just keen to know your opinion. Do you think that online psychometric tests are actually a good way to gauge if, if, you know, if somebody's a good, good candidate for the role? Really, really good question. I'm personally very interested in the field of psychometric testing. So I've done a lot of study in this field. Um, I'm curious how many of you are familiar with it. How many of you have heard of uh, the big five, the five factor model? Couple, okay. How many of you heard of Myers-Briggs? The website like 16 personalities, yeah. There are a couple of other models out there. Um, I've actually um, delved into this from the academic psychological perspective. Uh, the first thing to note is the Myers-Briggs is okay, but it's not scientifically as rigorous as the five-factor model. So if you're going to use any model, you should use the five-factor model. Um, I personally use personality profiling and psychometric testing as a framework to understand people, for sure. But I don't use testing in the hiring process for very specific reasons. One of them is that people get under kind of performance pressure when they're taking a test. Like if you're getting hired into a company and you, here's your psychometric test or IQ test, you feel under a lot of pressure. And what I prefer to do is test people's actual work. Like, uh, so for example, if I'm hiring an employee into my company, we do digital marketing, I'll say, have you ever built a website? Can I see your website that you've built? Uh, what kind of campaigns have you managed? I like to see the work that they've done and especially focus on the hands-on work and I focus a little bit less so on the personality profiling. But it's a really interesting question, and I've personally spent tons of time on this. Yeah. But I'd say, yeah, in summary, I wouldn't suggest using personality profiles for the reasons I mentioned. But if uh, the key about first truth and what is understanding people, if you want to understand people, a good way to do that would be to look at psychology and understand psychology, understand uh, the five factor model. Yeah. Does that answer the question well? Yeah. Bill on that, so you just uh, basically hire people through your performance index uh, after a few months, or do you just simply? In in my case, I'm in a small company, so I don't have any index to refer to, at least from the prior performance. Uh, my hiring process is pretty rigorous, and usually, especially for someone coming in as a junior position, it focuses on hands-on work. So, like, if someone's joining my company who has no prior experience. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of the fields we specialize in is search engine optimization, which is SEO. You might have heard of it, but basically making websites rank better in Google. And when someone applies for the job, if they're a junior and they have no prior experience, I'll say to them, okay, you have a week, go and build a website. It needs to have these criteria. It needs to be focused on this, this, and this. Come back to me and present to me about what you did. And I'll look at their tangible ability to learn within a week and the thought process. I'm not looking for perfection. A person who's just had a week to hack at it isn't going to be very good. But I'll look at like how do they think and how do they tackle the problem and how proactive are they and how do they approach the boundaries of their knowledge. Some people are really good at understanding what they know and what they don't know, whereas other people aren't. And so I look at those kinds of things in the way they present. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. This is a really good, these are really good questions and I think this topic could be uh, spent a lot of time could be spent on people yeah cool all right let's go to the next finding confront the brutal facts so I phrased a lot of these in terms of counterintuitiveness but this one isn't as strong to turn a company from good to great you might think that the executive team gets a hold of a lot of really insightful and unique information about the market about what's going on and the competition doesn't have that information. And then what they do is they use that information as a foundation to create strategies and directions. That makes a lot of sense, so that kind of works, right? And everyone agrees, let's go, let's shake it up, and it succeeds. That seems to make sense, but the findings are not that. Actually, what they found, and this is really fascinating, this study found that both comparison companies and good to great companies had equal access to information about what was going on in their markets. 
And the key was not the information they had access to, but how they reacted to the information. So good to great companies, now there's what they call, which I'll explain in a second, the Stockdale paradox. Good to great companies were first better at confronting brutal facts. In other words, terrible things that are happening in their industry or their company, why they are so mediocre. They were good at confronting those facts and not burying them. And second, which is the other side of the coin, it's a bit of a paradox, they were better at maintaining hope that they could succeed in the end. So those are two sides of the same thing. And I'll explain that in a second, but comparison companies failed on both fronts. So one example, I forgot whether it was Walgreens, I forgot which company it was, but one of them was a grocery chain, right? And just as the US was emerging from the, the Great Depression and the World Wars, this two grocery chains were kind of the same, doing fine, and they were experimenting about the future. What should we do strategically to succeed? So they tried what was called a superstore idea, which is aiming for convenience of the, the shoppers, making a store more convenient, not worrying so much about prices, because the, the American um, mindset was changing, coming out of a really dark economic time. Both of them tried exactly the same thing, and they succeeded very, very well in both cases. So the data was clear that this was a good idea, but the comparison company buried it. They didn't like the findings. They didn't like the idea. They didn't like the fact that it would make them have to turn around their whole business and change a lot about it. Whereas the good to great companies confronted that fact, saying, hey, we are not geared up for the future. The way we're currently doing business isn't going to be successful. And so they were better at confronting that fact and then taking action from it, even if it's really brutal. So here's what, they, what the book calls the Stockdale Paradox. And I'll explain where it comes from. Um, basically, this isn't from the study, but it's a really good analogy. Um, Admiral Jim Stockdale was a highest ranking US military officer in a, a Vietnamese um, war camp. He was a prisoner of war for eight years. He was tortured over 20 times. He never had a release date or no certainty about when he would come out. Now, Jim Collins, the author, interviewed this guy before they did the study, and they asked him questions about what it was like to be in a, in a you know, to be tortured and to be imprisoned and so on. And he was an interesting character because he had this kind of paradox about him. At the one hand, he never lost faith that he would one day get out of the prison camp. But on the other hand, he completely accepted the brutality of his situation. So he said, I never lost, lost faith in the end of the story. But then, uh, of course, he never knew when he was going to be released. Then when the author asked him, uh, wait, when, oh, sorry, I'll read this. Um, he said, I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. Then the author asked him, so, of the other prisoners in the camp, the other Americans who were in the Vietnamese camp, which ones didn't make it out? And he said, that's easy, the optimists. So the people who were really optimistic. Now, that's really confusing because the guy just said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. That sounds incredibly optimistic, doesn't it? But the point is, and this is, this is the next quote from the book, the optimists were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And then they, Christmas would come and it would go and they didn't escape the prison camp. And then they'd say, we're going to be out by Easter. And Easter would come and go and then Thanksgiving. And eventually they died of a broken heart. This is being optimistic without facing the brutal facts of your situation. So he said, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever that might be. So, and the quote, we're not getting out by Christmas, deal with it. So the reason he shared this in this book is because the research team discovered this trend in the good to get companies. They had this kind of paradox. On the one hand, they were very intimately aware with the brutal facts of their reality, why they were failing, how bad it really is, how bad their situation is. But on the other hand, they were extremely uh, faithful that one day they would manage to make it out. And they managed to embrace both sides without losing discipline. So there's a quote from the book. From that, um, one of the research uh, participants said, that's exactly what I've been struggling with. I've been trying to get my head around the essential difference between two of the companies. 
and that's it. Krugel was like Stockdale, and AMP was like the Optimus who always thought that would be out by Christmas. So the comparison companies, in summary, were too optimistic. They always thought they'd be able to make, you know, succeed sooner, whereas the good to great companies were more disciplined in facing the brutal reality they were in. So my quote, many good to great companies were in deep shit, one way or the other, and it didn't matter how bleak, this is a quote from one of the leaders, it didn't matter how bleak the situation, oh sorry, from the book, how bleak the situation or how stultifying their mediocrity, they all maintained unwavering faith that they would not just survive but prevail as a great company, and yet at the same time they became relentlessly disciplined at confronting the most brutal facts. So this is a paradox, and some of the findings of this book are, in essence, paradoxical. It's two sides of a coin. Cool. So here's uh, an example. Wait, before we move on, any questions about this? Does that sound interesting? That's an interesting finding. Yeah. Yes. Did you talk this with your, with your I mean, employees or with your peers? Did they accept that? I don't talk about paradoxical thinking much with my employees, but I think about it a lot. Um, in, they call it a dialectic, dialectical thinking. Um, how many of you speak Chinese? Mandarin. Zi xiang ma wu dun, one of my favorite uh, oh. phrases. Yeah. <laughs> Four letter phrase. Um, yeah, I, I study Chinese. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I don't speak with it about my employees, but I do think about it a lot personally. And if you read a lot of Jim Collins' work, in fact, the logo of his first book before Good to Great is Yin Yang, this logo. Yeah. So a lot of the. Um, a lot of the uh, findings from the book is these people who manage to do something that looks quite paradoxical. Take, for example, level five leadership. You'd expect someone who's a really humble person to not have a lot of willpower, but they had both. Yeah. In Confront the Brutal Facts, you'd expect someone who's very good at confronting how bad everything is, who's, who's so pessimistic, or like, you'd, sorry, you'd expect someone who's good at confronting how bad it is to be pessimistic at the same time. Say, well, things are really, really bad, right? But they were paradoxical. They were both good at looking at how bad it was and good at having hope. And that's quite difficult to find that kind of paradox. Yeah. So yeah, it's a good question. Do you teach that in the course? <laughs> paradoxical thinking? <laughs> it's a philosophical kind of topic, yeah. That's a really good example. So here's an example. I'm just going to give um, a quick example of how they created a climate of truth. This is one of the other findings from the book. By the way, how much time do we have? Till 4.40? 4.40? Yeah, okay, cool. We got that. So this is one of my favorite findings from the book. So. In order to confront the brutal facts, you have to be good at creating a climate of truth where people know what's going on. Have any of you heard of the mum effect? I think it's called the mum effect. I learned this when I was in uni. So basically, imagine you have a boss who's a really dominant personality. How do you feel bringing bad news to your boss? Right? Yeah. It doesn't feel good, right? Eh, I'm going to shy away from telling it how it is. I'm going to shy away from how intense the bad news is. So you'll, you'll be euphemistic. You'll, you'll make it slightly less bad. You know, oh, things are going not as well as we would hope, as opposed to it's terrible, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the key, that's called the mum effect, which is a kind of a management principle which is that when, when bosses or people have a certain personality, they actually restrict the truth from getting to them because they're so dominant and they, they push back and angry when some bad news comes to them. So they restrict themselves from knowing what's actually going on. And so in order to successfully confront the brutal facts, you need a climate of truth. You need a company where everyone at every level is good at engaging with reality. And one of the best ways to do that, there are four findings from the book that you can apply quite readily. So the first is to lead with questions and not answers. We have this common assumption, we're talking about the CEO and the American personality, right? We have this common assumption that the CEO should be the person with the biggest vision and the person with all the answers, right? That's our, our typical understanding of business and leadership. But in this study, the CEO in these companies was the person, was the person with the best questions. 
So what would happen is the CEO would get the right people on the bus and the executive team and then field really good questions to them. So why are we mediocre? Why is our performance bad? What's going on? And not in an attacking way to blame, again, going to one of the early findings, but with a true desire to understand what's actually going on and what's the truth, right? So that's the first finding is that the CEOs, and they describe some of the board meetings, that the CEOs would just ask tons and tons of questions. They were relentlessly curious to know exactly what's going on and have a clear vision of reality, whereas many CEOs aren't necessarily that curious. They're, they're more so, I have a vision, you guys just need to do it. And if you don't do it, that's why it's not working. Right. So they engaged in dialogue and debate, not coercion. So that, uh, this is what I just mentioned. The style of asking questions was sincerely to understand. They conducted autopsies without blame, which is what we described before. They took responsibility for failures so that other people wouldn't feel that burden of blame when sharing what happened. And they built what they called red flag mechanisms that force you to face information. So this is a really exaggerated case from the study. One of the companies implemented a policy with their clients that if you're not satisfied with our product, you can pay the invoice to whatever dollar figure you like. So if you invoice a, a company, uh, sorry, you deliver a product and you issue an invoice to a client for $100,000, they're not happy, so they pay you back $10,000. Well, that's putting a lot of power in the hands of your clientele. Very few people have the guts to do that, but one of the good to great companies did. I'm not suggesting you do that as a policy, but what it illustrates, I think, many, I think few companies would survive it if they did that, by the way. I think very few companies would survive. But it, it created a red flag mechanism, which is like a, a systematic mechanism to make them face the truth. If our customer is unhappy, we will know it because they underpay, right? So how do you apply this principle into your life? I think it's, I think it's a pretty clear principle to apply. Um, just try to understand what's going wrong and, and try to grow your self-awareness and find the problems but have hope that you can succeed. That's, of course, the Stockdale paradox. So we're going to go to the next section, which is about strategy. And uh, my first question would be, in your studies, do you spend a lot of time talking about strategy, corporate strategy? Yeah, yeah. So corporate strategy is like one of the biggest areas that anyone who's studying business or management would spend a lot of time in. And this book and the study has a lot to say about corporate strategy, which I find very, very interesting. So we'll, we'll get into that and I'll try to mix in some questions as we go along. The next section is called the hedgehog concept. And I'm going to start off with a metaphor that's from this book. Uh, it's a metaphor created by Isaiah Berlin and he has an essay about it. And, and it's really about this, this idea of the fox versus the hedgehog. So what is this? Imagine that there is a fox and a hedgehog. Uh, the fox is a very sleek, elegant creature, very complicated, understands the world, comes up with a lot of different strategies and ways to attack the hedgehog and to eat it, okay? Whereas the hedgehog is a very simple creature. What it does is it understands that if the fox attacks it, all it has to do is roll up into a ball and the spines will face outwards and the hedgehog can't eat it. So what, what he says in the book is the fox understands many things, but the hedgehog understands one big thing. The fox understands many different attack angles and is a complex um, a thinker, whereas the hedgehog is plain and straightforward. So using the words that they um, use in the study, foxes pursue many ends at the same time and see the world in all its complexity. They are scattered or diffused, moving on many levels. Whereas hedgehogs understand that the essence of profound insight is simplicity. So hedgehogs, it's not that hedgehogs don't see the complexity of the world, it's that they see that complexity, but they reduce complexity to the most simple elements. Now, why do I share this analogy with you? Well, let me ask you the first question. If you were to think of corporate strategy and successful corporate strategy, which of these two personalities do you think would be most effective at coming up with the strategy? It's a bit of a leading question, I think, because the chapter is called Hedgehog Concept. <laughs> but don't you think that your intuitions might be that understanding complexity is very important? 
when it comes to strategy. And coming up with lots of different ideas also seems really important. That's what our natural intuition is. But what they found in the study, and they came to codify it in this language of Fox versus Hedgehog, is that the successful good to great companies were hedgehog thinkers. They thought in simplistic terms. They sought to strip away the noise and the clutter and find what's most important. So um, going back to this, before you can come up with corporate strategy, there's something that underlies that, which is a kind of corporate vision. But not all vision is equal. Uh, the common understanding is that vision is like the is, is sort of wild dreams. We have this idea of an entrepreneur who has a massive vision that's going to change the world. But in the good to great cases, it's very important to contextualize this. Good to great companies were not startups, right? They were not these disruptors coming in to change the world. They were mediocre companies that transitioned from poor performance to great performance. And in the case of their strategies, they were more empirically creative. What it means is they were deriving their strategic directions from reality as opposed to from visions. So they had this, this is another one of those paradoxes, they were empirical in the sense that they drew their strategic insights from what actually is happening in reality, from data, from feedback, and they were creative in their application of those insights. So this, what we'll, I'll describe in a bit more detail, but what the hedgehog concept is, is it's something that comes before corporate strategy. It's insight that, that drives strategy. So where you would ordinarily jump, and this is what the comparison companies did, they would jump straight to a strategy. They would think, okay, we are mediocre, what should we do, right? But in the case of these good to great companies, they first struck on insights that drove strategy, that came before strategy. So hedgehog concept is in essence a simplistic idea that can drive corporate strategies. And strategies are derived and checked against the hedgehog concept. So I'm gonna give uh, some quotes here. First, this is a quote from the, the book Good to Great. Those who built the good to great companies were to one degree or another hedgehogs. They used their hedgehog nature to drive forward what we came to call the hedgehog concept for their companies. Those who led the comparison companies tended to be foxes never gaining the clarifying advantage of a hedgehog concept, being instead scattered, diffused, and inconsistent. So the good to great companies had a core understanding of something that, under, that, that sat before their strategies. They understood something deeper that drove their strategies. And we'll get to exactly what that is in a second. But I want to, illu I want to illustrate that it's not as if they came up with this overnight. Uh, when they studied these companies and, and what their hedgehog concept was, what their driving idea was, it took them on average four years to come up with that concept. So imagine you have these level five leaders that we've described. They are um, infused with the brutal facts of reality and they, they understand their niche and they have a team of really smart executives. It takes them four years on average to drive insight into a key idea that will help them to succeed. That just shows you how massive this is. It's not really an easy thing to do. So um, I'm going to give a quote about hedgehog versus fox thinking. This is from a different author. How many of you have heard of Jack Welch? You must all have heard of him. Huh? Really? Oh, OK. Oh, I didn't know. Jack Welch? Yes. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. That's sad, because I listened to his podcast. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, uh, Jack Welch is a very famous CEO and was the CEO of General Electric for something like 10 years. This is one of my favorite quotes from his book. I think it's from Winning. He says, insecure managers create complexity. Frightened, nervous managers use thick, convoluted planning books and busy slides filled with everything they've known since childhood. They worry that if they're simple, people will think they're simple-minded. In reality, of course, it's just the reverse. Clear, tough-minded people are the most simple. So, the, again, a, s a systematic finding between the gold and the silver medalist, the good to great and the comparison, was that the good to great companies were simpler thinkers than the comparison companies. The comparison companies tended to lurch about and create lots of different complicated strategies. So, what was in common in these strategies? What, what was the finding that was across all 11 of the good to great companies? Well, what they found is that they managed to create uh, a, an insight 
into what their organization should do, what direction it should broadly take. And that direction came in the intersection of the three circles here. The first is what they were deeply passionate about. The second was what they were the best in the world at. And the third was what drove their economic engine. So that's very interesting. If you think about it, this is, again, before strategy. This is insight into who you are as an organization that can then drive your strategy. Uh, what you're deeply passionate about. We'll start off with that. Um, we'll start off with that. Uh, why was it important that they as an organization were deeply passionate about doing a thing? Because being really good at something is very hard, and work is really hard. Excelling is really hard. So passion is the only thing that can truly drive you to succeed in the long term. If you're not passionate about something, you'll never be really, really good at it or drive yourself to the future. So that's the first area of what they were passionate about. What could they be the best in the world at? So the author shares a story from his own life. The, Jim Collins was a mathematician, um, but what happened is he was, he was studying mathematics through high school, through university, and he was really good at mathematics. But then what happened is when he got to a high level, he started to take exams, and he would take an examination, and the time would be three hours to do this math exam, and he would finish it on time, and he would do fine. But some of the other people in the room would finish the exam in 30 minutes and get full marks. That's what's meant by what you're the best at. So it's not just you're competent at something, it's you're the best at something. And so what he described here is that he met people who were, quote, genetically encoded to do mathematics. So that's what is meant here by what you are the best at. If you want to build a hedgehog concept about what an organization can do, you need to ask what's in our blood, what's in our veins, what are we genetically encoded to? What are we so good at that it's obvious that we're the best? That's what they stumbled across. And finally, what drove their economic engine is that they frequently, um, they, the hedgehog concept, what they came to describe it as, was an economic denominator. So what they would settle on is optimizing the company by profit per something, right? So profit per X. For example, Fannie Mae, uh, the mortgage um, the mortgage bank, or what, I don't know what it is, but mortgage company, they optimize their company for making the most profit at every mortgage risk level. Now, if you think about it, that sounds simple. It makes sense. But there are many ways you can optimize an organization. You could optimize it to make the most profit per headcount. So we try to make as much profit as possible, and we have as least people as possible. Um, you can optimize companies various ways. But what they did is they stumbled across, over time, the best way to optimize a company. So in the case of Wells Fargo, they settled on profit per employee. So they focused on automation, ultimately. Can we maximize the profit per employee? And Kroger, which was a grocery store, I think, um, focused on profit per local population. So they focused on can we establish ourselves in a particular area, become number one or number two in that area, and then ignore other factors. They just focus on optimizing that. And Walgreens, which I think was um, a pharmaceutical, uh, like a chemist, they focused on profit per customer visit. So when a single customer comes in, can we sell them as much as possible? Those are different focuses, and that's how they shifted their economic engine from one thing to the other. Now, I personally can't tell you how they did this or how they figured this out, because this is a process that, said that takes four years. One of the things that this author um, spoke about is that after he shared this book, the business community read it and asked him questions, they asked him, like, okay, how can we find our hedgehog concept? How can we find our economic engine? And he realized that in setting it up this way, he made it sound really simple, but he exaggerated in some sense how easy it is. It looks really easy. So, but it's important to note that it took the companies on average four years to figure out exactly what their hedgehog concept is. So you have a team of really smart, visionary, good people, and it takes them four years to figure out what to do. You can understand that that's a very key insight that they managed to gain. And in all 11 cases of good to great, they obtained it, whereas all of their comparisons never managed to obtain that kind of simple thinking. So, um, 
Any questions so far about that? Before I move on to others, yeah. So does the hedgehog, co hedgehog concept apply to the company or like managers and employees or like both? The company, the oh. company's overall strategy. Okay. Yeah. So what they would do is they'd come up with this hedgehog concept, like what if, again, these three circles, and then they'd use that to create strategies. So like, oh, if we have this opportunity to make this acquisition or to take this to prevent, uh, create this technology or whatever, they would always check it against the hedgehog concept to see does that make sense given what we're trying to achieve. So that was the discipline. But yeah, it's talking about the whole org. Yeah. So I want to um, I want to share just a bit about this concept from my own personal life. Uh, as I said, the first time I got exposed to this book was about ten years ago. And I definitely would consider myself a fox at that time. Uh, I, I personally was very interested in language. I was interested in all sorts of things. And when I would prepare presentations to give to my peers or whatever environment I was in, I would always fill it with a lot of complicated stuff that made me look really smart. Right? And when I came across this concept, especially this, um, this quote by Jack Welsh, it actually hit me personally really hard. Because it's a very stark quote to say, insecure managers create complexity. Um, but I think I, I've now come to a point where I very much am aligned with this. I very much agree with this idea. If you are secure in your work, secure as a manager, and you're a clear thinker, you will be simple. You will implement simple, straightforward strategies that make a lot of sense. So it's, to some degree, the hedgehog concept of this chapter was about how they think as a company. It's, not a, it's about what they do, but it was also about how they think, how they as individuals in an organization tended to think. They tended to be focused on simplicity. And now, that doesn't mean you're simple-minded if you're focused on simplicity. There's a, a very important distinction between those two. Cool. So, how can you apply this? Uh, simplify things and seek insight. Right? Try to strip away from complexity. And you can also apply this in your personal life. I think this is very applicable to your career. Like, if you apply this to your personal life, what are you really passionate about? If you're thinking about the future direction of your career, what can you be really good at and what makes economic sense? If you have two but not three, it will never get you really, really great results. So, for example, if you're really passionate about crocheting and you're really good at it, that doesn't mean you'll make a lot of money from doing it. And so if you're really passionate about something but, and it makes money, but you're not the best, you also won't get that level of performance. No matter how you slice it, if you have two out of three, it never fully delivers. Yeah. Cool. Any questions? Can I ask a question about uh, hiring? Because you mentioned about hiring people, the right people, and um, on the bus and so on. Mm. But just thinking about it from the future, there are people more, more like a fox type of person, one more kind of a, like a hedgehog person. Mm. But as a team, I mean, understand as a leader, maybe you need to more act as a hedgehog. But uh, in the team, is it always necessary to, or good actually have only have hedgehog type of person? Or actually, is it better to have a mixed one? That's a, that's a really good question. I think from I can answer from the finding that the entire organization tended to be hedgehog type people. Yeah. So it's really difficult to, in some sense, justify this finding intellectually because it, the fox seems to make a lot of sense. Like people who understand well, complexity. Kind of, what kind of journalists? You know what yes. stuff. But for hedgehogs, it's more kind of specialized. So yeah. they are actually very good at um, what they are doing. But for a company, obviously, to me, you need actually different types of person. Yeah. But that's about how to manage the potential. You know, the potential company. Yeah. The whole equation. Yeah. I think, ultimately, I think First, I think the hedgehog versus fox is not about specialty, per se. I don't think it's versus like generalist or specialist, per se. I think it's more about just how people think and how they strip away complexity. So, for instance, um, I, I don't know if yeah, let's ask this as an open question. How many of you have had a friend or been around a colleague who just overcomplicates things? <laughs> right? I'm sure we're probably... Okay. That's a bad question, because everyone's going to say yes. <laughs> um, We've all been around people who overcomplicate things. That's the fox-like mentality. So it's really about like trying to reach insight through the way the complexity. 
Um, there's a very good, unfortunately I won't be able to find it really quickly on Google, so I'll, I'll kind of draw it. There's a really good diagram that I saw that kind of explains this principle, where you have these sort of data points, right? And what the diagram explains is the difference between data, information, knowledge, and insight. Right, so it's like the progression of understanding. So this is how data looks. It's just a bunch of points of data, right? Information is like highlighting these in different colors, right, or different shapes. That's extrapolating a bit of something from the data, right? But then this insight is about highlighting what is important and relevant and realizing what's important and relevant and then stripping away the rest. So that's really what I think this chapter and Hedgehog concept is about. It's like, it's going through that process of deepening your understanding of what things mean generally, like your process of thinking, and coming out with simple insights. That's the idea. So if you think about, and they raise this in the book, many of the greatest thinkers were very much hedgehog type people. So Einstein came up with E equals MC squared, a single equation to describe something very elegant, right? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Sigmund Freud with the um, id, ego, and superego. I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, psychology, but it was a very simple idea. A lot of the greatest contributors to knowledge have come with elegantly simple concepts. And so that's why they said these companies thought like that. Yeah. Hmm? So you believe we can be nurtured into being like simple thinkers? Like, it, like is it more nature? Because like, I feel like some hmm. people may naturally just like overcomplicate things or they may be like. Hmm. Like yeah. um, is, it, is it something we can change with, with like practice or with experience? Yeah, I think so. Um, especially by asking certain questions. So I'll give you some questions that I think are like hedgehog thinker type questions, right? What does this mean? Great question. So like often you, in your discussions about a, a company or its performance or whatever, you'll talk about a lot of data, you'll talk about a lot of environment, but then you ask a question, I think the key word is relevancy. Like, what does this mean to us? What are the implications of this to us? That's an, an example of like a hedgehog kind of question. Or um, I would say, what's, this is, what's next? So like we, we can have a lot of discussion about something, but what are we going to do with this? Right? That's, that's like trying to drive the insight to a point of action or to a point of, uh, drive the data to a point of insight and then action. Yeah. I think. I mean, I think generally when you read and are exposed to these ideas and you become more aware of it, that can drive you forward in that journey. Yeah. I mean, as I said, I'm a, a self-avowed, confessed ex-fox. Like, I definitely see myself as being a fox in the past. Yeah. Uh, so the next, the next finding, which is a shorter finding, was a culture of discipline. So a key finding in the study can be summarized with the single word discipline. It's one of my personal favorite words. And what they explain here is that the, the progression, and you'll see this in the framework actually, if you look at the little text underneath the, the findings, it has disciplined people, disciplined thought, and disciplined action. So these three things, and discipline is obviously the common denominator. So all of the good to great transitions hired and created a culture of discipline by hiring people who were disciplined, who then engaged in disciplined thought, and then acted in disciplined ways. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about what is discipline. It's a, it's a single word that I feel like in this book especially has a very uh, foundational uh, role in the concepts here. So this understanding can help us connect with good to great. And um, shoot to number three. I don't know where I would put that. Sorry. Oh, right. Sorry. Yes. To clarify. What's the difference between the good to great companies and the comparison companies? The good to great companies did one, two, three. They hired disciplined people, engaged in disciplined thought, and then did disciplined action. Where the comparison companies tried to go straight to number three. Just take action. Do something really great now. And that's one of the key differences. So, I've spent time in preparing this lecture thinking about how would you describe discipline to people who don't know what it is. Like, what does this word really mean? And I think one of the essences of discipline is consistency. So think about it in your personal life. How many of you have wanted to go to the gym and set a New Year's resolution to go to the gym? And then what happens afterwards? If it doesn't happen, that's lack of discipline, right? 
And if it does happen, there's discipline. So the key is consistency. It's the self of 1st of January is, is consistent with the self of the 14th of January and the 14th of February, etc. So you have this kind of consistency. When you say one thing on one day, you say the same thing later. And you do the same thing later. Um, one of the... Uh, it was Bill Gates. There was a... a, a there was a... AMA on Reddit with Bill Gates a few years ago, and they were asking him questions. And one of the answers that he gave, someone came on and commented and said, I took an internship in Microsoft when, Bill, when it was still young, etc., with Bill Gates. And he said exactly the same things. Like he said one thing 15 years before and said exactly the same thing 15 years later. He had this radical consistency. That doesn't mean never changing, it just means that there's a high level of consistency. So, here are some examples of discipline. I'm going to first start with new ideas. So like, how does a disciplined person think? And what's the difference between disciplined thinking and non-disciplined thinking? So I've coined this term, uh, actually I actually have an article on my blog, if you want to read it, called Latch and Lurch. So the comparison companies, whenever they encountered some piece of new information, they would latch onto that information and say, oh, this is, this is amazing, this is a game changer, this changes everything. And then they would lurch towards it. They would, they would radically alter the organization to chase that shiny new object that they just came across. Um, but for hedgehog thinkers, for disciplined thinkers, whenever you learn a new piece of information, you think about how does that plug in with everything we already know about how things work. So the, the comparison companies tended to drop their other ideas more rapidly. Whereas the, the hedgehog companies, the good to great companies, integrated new information into their worldview along with all of the old information. So that's one element of rigorous thought. Like what does this new piece of information mean? And what if you try to plug it into your existing understanding of what's going on and try to overcome biases. Now I've seen this play out a lot in the corporate environment because uh, people are very easily sucked into fads and trends, right? And Discipline is taking that fad and that trend and understanding how that plays into what you already know, what you already understand quite well. So that's, that's an example of disciplined thought, which is how you deal with new ideas. New strategies. Um, when they came up with new strategies of what to do, they would do it in the context of the hedgehog concept. That's disciplined. So they, once they came across this hedgehog concept, what they wanted to drive for, they were fanatically consistent with that hedgehog concept. Uh, and that, that exact wording is used in the book, fanatic consistency. So there was, from the book, quote, there was no maniac lurching about, no hype, no bravado, just calm, deliberate pursuit of understanding, followed by calm, deliberate steps forward. So here are some other examples of, of discipline. First, disciplined people. What are disciplined people like? Disciplined people tend to be disciplined in every aspect of their lives. So the people that they hired, for example, if someone's disciplined, you'd expect them to be good at certain fundamental things. For example, even the basics, like how many of us sleep consistently, go to bed on time, how many of us exercise regularly. These are all things that plug into discipline. Then the disciplined people would engage in rigorous thinking and take disciplined action. Disciplined people are not particularly bureaucratic. So when you have the right people on the bus, the environment is not very political. And disciplined people, uh, the, the discipline of these organizations as they studied them would propagate from the executive team across the whole company in an organic way because you hire disciplined people as opposed to the leader being a kind of tyrant who would discipline the people, like a, like a drill sergeant, right? So I'm going to give just one last, I'm going to skip some of these middle ones. I'm going to give one last example of, of discipline, which is number three there of discipline thought. How many of you, uh, curious question about your studies, how many of you talk about the pressure to generate ROI as like a psychological pressure within companies, within management? I don't know if you talk about that much in your studies. Okay. Anyone who's working in a company as an executive has stakeholders, shareholders. Or people who own the company who wanted to generate ROI. One of the ways in which you need to psychologically manage that is to understand and, and deal with that pressure. Like, 
let's say, for example, the earlier example of a company losing a million dollars a day, there's immense pressure on that person to generate ROI, to fix things, right? But one way to be disciplined is to manage that pressure and to optimize your organization such that the short term and the long term are catered for. So this is another one of those paradoxes, the way that these people engage in disciplined thought. They didn't make short term decisions or long term decisions, they made both short term and long term decisions. That's an example of discipline. So they managed shareholder pressure by trying to generate good returns in the short term, but still investing in the long term. Many organizations, and I know this, I, we're, I'm in a company, I deal with clients every day, many modern organizations are very short term focused, very focused on ROI right now. And so that's, for instance, not very disciplined. Cool. And one final thing, discipline involves a stop doing list. How many of you have, when you plan your New Year's resolutions, how many of you plan a not-to-do list? Things you want to stop doing. Cool. Right. That's, that's an example of discipline. Right. It's like, it's not just a to-do list, it's a not-to-do list. What things that I want to stop doing. Right. That's an example. Cool. That was good though. Oh. One, one final, okay, one final point, and then I'm going to uh, skip past that. Um, we talked about strategy, corporate strategy, right? The good to great companies change their strategies less often than the comparison companies. We'll get to this in the last uh, section, which is the flywheel. But even if you look at a scope of two to three years, if you zoom out, uh, which is sort of like the, the tenure of a CEO, you could say, depending on how long they stay, the comparison companies tend to change strategy more often. So that's an, another example of discipline. All right, I want to get into the last chapter. We're in, a, we're in a culture where we come across companies like Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, and we very much are sensitive to and attuned to the disruption that technology brings. We're highly focused on technology. And one of the interesting chapters of this book is about technology and how it accelerated the results. I want to read this quote to help us have a paradigm about technology. It's a really good quote. Throughout business history, early technology pioneers rarely prevail in the end. VisiCalc, for example, was the first major personal computer spreadsheet. Where is VisiCalc today? Do you know anyone who uses it and the company that pioneered it? It doesn't even exist. VisiCalc eventually lost out to Lotus 123, which itself lost out to Excel. Excel is probably the first name among those names that everyone recognizes, right? Lotus then went into a tailspin, saved only by IBM. Similarly, across many uh, tech industries, the initial innovator didn't succeed. So this, this is a very fascinating uh, and important paradigm shift for us because we're in a culture that obsesses about innovation and technology. But statistically, if you're the first one to the market, you are most likely to fail. The people who will succeed are usually number two and number three. So how, how did that pan out for the good to great companies? They avoided technology fans, the fads and bandwagons. This is, again, disciplined thought. A fad is when everybody moves in a particular direction and does something. The good to great companies avoided fads like that. Their question was, does this technology help us achieve our hedgehog concept? If yes, we will master it and be very innovative. If no, we will achieve parity or ignore it. Parity just means as good as everybody else. So for example, if you want to be, I don't know, for us, we want to be a great digital marketing company, we don't need a really advanced phone system. That's an example of parity. Our phone system can just be as good as everybody else's. Right? So the good to great companies thought differently about technology. They mastered and innovated in certain technologies that were highly uh, likely to produce results or to accelerate momentum, but they didn't jump on fads or bandwagons. So I'm going to skip through because of time. Right, so we're going to unfortunately skip. That's okay. I'm just going to skip through because of time because I, I want to get through some of the last concepts. I want to talk finally about the flywheel before we wrap up. Because this is one of the most interesting findings. This is the big loop around the entire framework, right? This is how good to great transitions look from the outside, right? If you look at that initial picture of the mediocre performance and then a transition, 
you just see suddenly a company taking off, right? That looks amazing. So from the outside, how does a good to great transition look? It looks like an egg, and then suddenly there's a chicken bursting out, right? And so what happened when, the, when these companies made this transition is that the media, as soon as they started to generate really superior returns, the media started to publish a lot about these companies because they were outstanding. So to tease their style of publishing, the author wrote these quotes, the transformation of egg to chicken, right? These are like headlines, right? The remarkable revolution of the egg, stunning turnaround at egg. This is how the media perceived this change of good to great, because suddenly there was, it was old, sleepy, mediocre company, and then suddenly it erupted, it became amazing. But how does it look like from the chicken's perspective? Well, the egg hatching was just one of many incremental steps that came before. And I actually just Googled an image here. Um, and you can see that from the chicken's perspective, the egg was just, the hatching was just one natural event after another. It was developing and coming for a long time. So the good to great leaders, when they spoke about their transition, they didn't see it as a transition, actually. They just saw it as an organic evolution. So the analogy they use, they finally settled on in this book, is the flywheel. This is a flywheel. So how would you move this? Imagine you, your job is to generate momentum in this object. So what you would do is probably, you would start turning it, but putting in a lot of effort initially, you wouldn't get very far. But it would gradually build momentum, and it would be sort of exponential. And that's exactly how these transition, transitions happen, is that there was this build-up, for a period of time when they were just getting things right. And then there was a breakthrough, and they didn't even know that that breakthrough was necessarily going to happen. So the, the framework that they use to speak about this is they would take steps forward that are consistent with their hedgehog concept. It would accumulate results. People would get excited and get on board by those results. They would build more momentum, and this is a perpetuating loop, right? The comparison companies, however, had the opposite, what they called the doom loop, which is they had disappointing results, then they reacted to those results without understanding why they were having disappointing results. They invented a new direction. As I said earlier, they came up with a new strategy, a new leader, a program, a fad, an acquisition. But it didn't build up momentum, and so that leads back to disappointing results. And this is a very direct finding from this study. So I'm going to skip a lot of this, but the core essence here is that the good to great companies had a pattern of a build up, then a breakthrough, whereas the great, the uh, comparison companies were kept lurching from one thing to another, changing again and again and again, trying this strategy, then this strategy, but never building on the momentum of their predecessors. One of the things that, um, that, that did that is leadership changes. So like if you're in a company and you want to generate great momentum, you can't have a new CEO come every three to four years and then change the direction of the whole organization again and again and again, because you lose all prior momentum. So it takes years to accumulate momentum, but the signs that you're heading in the right direction come early. Right. Cool. So any questions about that? Does that make sense, the flywheel effect? Yeah. Cool. OK, I'm going to wrap up with some afterthoughts. And then we'll have time, a little bit of time, for any last questions, right? I'm going to end by reading one of the, the, reading the quote that is in the beginning of the book. Good is the enemy of great. And that is one of the key reasons why we have so little that becomes great. We don't have great schools, principally because we have good schools. We don't have great government, principally because we have good government. Few people attain great lives, in large part because it's just so easy to settle for a good life. So if I want to leave you with anything at the end of this lecture, it's this quote right here, which is, if you want to achieve greatness, the, the number one thing standing in your way is that you're satisfied with who you are. You're satisfied with the way things are. And so you settle for just having a good life. And I love this insight that the reason we don't have great things is because we have good things. That's a very interesting um, sort of dichotomy is that good is the enemy of great. And this is a high level trend, is that all of these comparison companies needed to change fundamental things about them, but it was really difficult to do so. And it's much easier to just settle for where you are. Cool.
Thank you all.